Hi everybody. So now we're going to go on to relativistic quantum mechanics and we'll start with the Klein-Gordon equation. So for the rest of this course, we're going to have, uh, we're going to need some definitions and we're going to use everywhere the metric signature for the Minkowski metric is defined as g mu mu we're going to use 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, which is pretty common. Um, and the only book that I can think of that doesn't use that one at the top of my head is the Weinberg book uh, on gravitation and cosmology. So uh, this is a Minkowski metric. So all the other g mu nu, where nu is not equal to new, they're all zero. Okay, so that's the signature. So, notation. Let's see how we go. So, x mu is defined as ct x y z. Okay? Um, Again, C is the speed of light. Uh, this is the contravariant uh, position. Um, contravariant vector of position. Uh, so again, C equals one, but sometimes I'm gonna put it, uh, the C in explicitly just so that we remember where it goes uh, in the cases that we need to. And x mu, which we could generate by doing, say, g mu nu x nu, where summation is implied over the in index nu. So repeated indices, there's always an implied summation. That's Einstein notation. And so this one becomes ct minus x minus y minus z. And this is the covariant. vector. Okay, uh, similarly, we can define the momenta. So P mu is E over C PX PY PZ, which we sometimes will just write as E over C and P, like so. And that's the contravariant uh, momentum. And again, we can form the covariant, which is just gonna be E over C minus P. Okay, and that's the covariant version. All right, now, now that we've made that, uh, we, we can start, actually. So this is kind of fun. I, I learned this from uh, Misha Kuchia, who used to work here at UNSW in the theory department. Um, he taught me this nice little trick, and I really liked it. So we're going to start with the Lorentz condition. And the Lorentz condition, Lorentz invariance, what's that law? And it's for a free particle, right? So no fields yet. Free particle. So Lorentz says that P mu P mu no no quantum mechanics yet, uh, which equals E squared over C squared minus vector P squared is a constant. So P mu P mu is a constant because it's a scalar. That's the whole point. And we'll call that constant A. A doesn't mean anything, I'm just putting in a constant. Okay, so now let's rearrange that equation for E, and that says that E is equal to the square root of A C squared plus P squared. 
c squared. Okay, uh, still not saying anything about what a is. Now we're going to take the non-relativistic limit. And the non-relativistic limit is when the momentum goes to zero. So let's expand E around the small momentum limit. So we'll take out the square root of A times C, and then we've got the square root of one plus P squared over A. Good. And now let's expand this small parameter p squared on a. So we'll get square root of a times c times 1 plus p squared over 2a minus p to the 4 over 8a squared plus dot dot dot. So that's the expansion of the square root. And if we just keep the first couple of terms of that, we've got square root of a c uh, plus p squared c over 2 times the square root of a. And extra terms. Now this one, this first term here, that's got to be the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is p squared over 2m. Remember, we're in the, we're, we are in the non-relativistic limit here. So p squared over 2m has got to be equal to p squared c over 2 times the square root of a. So square root of a is equal to mc, and a equals m squared c squared so we've found our constant and that means that means that the equation is p mu p mu equals m squared c squared and we've gotten all of that directly from Lorentz invariance nothing else oh and the non-relativistic limit which you know quite well. Um, and so we can write E is equal to mc squared plus p squared over 2m minus p to the 4 over 8m to the 4, c to the 4, <clears throat> uh, plus dot, dot, dot. So, and like I said, this follows directly. Now, I'm mostly going to use natural units, but again, so mostly using h bar equals c equals 1. Um, I did make a short video on that, so have a look at that if you um, haven't already and you want a refresher on natural units. Now, in quantum, it's time for some quantum mechanics. We haven't done any quantum mechanics yet. Let's put some quantum mechanics in there. So, after all, it is a quantum mechanics course. I can't spell quantum mechanics, however. So, and that's for free waves. The ansatz for free waves is that the wave function is some constant perhaps times e to the i over h bar p dot r minus energy times time. All right, that is familiar to all of you, hopefully. So that's a plane wave. Now, 
it's quantum mechanics. So our old P mu, which was, now I'm skipping the C again, by the way, E P. Um, that is now going to be placed where P is now an operator and it's minus I H bar times grad. Same as we always had before. And so that means that we can then define P mu, the covariant version, as I H bar D mu equals I D dx mu. And so E is I H bar D dct equals i h bar over c times d dt. So we're seeing how all of this fits together. So that's the operator for the energy, the operator for momentum. Um, sorry, I should put a little hat over that guy as well. Um, so that's the operator for the momentum. And uh, that means that we can write also the contravariant momentum operator p mu equals i h bar g d c t minus grad and now you start to see why um why i really don't want to keep my c's and h bars around because they start to get very annoying very quickly. I'm going to keep them going for a bit longer just to make sure that we really hammer it home where it is supposed to go and so that you will be able to recover it should you need to. That would be unlikely to happen in an exam because then I would have to mark you and then I'd have to remember myself where the H bars and the C's go. Okay. So that is um, an operator form for the scalar quantity P mu P mu. And now if we take that and we apply that to our plane wave, we will get, if we apply it to our plane wave, we'll get, well, derivative with respect to time is going to bring down the i epsilon over h bar, i times the energy over h bar. So that's going to be e squared. So i squared over h bar squared will cancel out the minus h bar squared out the front. And then we're just going to be left with the e squared and minus p squared. is going to come down as well. And that's going to be equal to m squared phi because that is, as we found before, that's the constant. And so, um, so this is a kind of quantum, a quantum mechanical way of getting to the same set of equations. Um, Another way that this is sometimes written would be something like where the p has a hat but it doesn't have an arrow, so it's not got, it's not got like a little vectory arrow. But we know momentum is a vector. This is actually four momentum squared. So this is saying four momentum squared um, phi equals m squared phi, or we could also write. minus d squared phi. You'll sometimes see it written like this as well. Okay, 
and that is something like the Klein-Gordon equation. So we're already there. The next step is to start thinking about gauge invariance. So quantum mechanics is invariant under phase transformations. What do you mean by that? Let's check this out. So if we take your wave function phi and you replace it with some other phi prime, which is the same as the original one, but multiplied by some phase factor, then quantum mechanics should not change. If alpha of x is just some alpha, some constant, then this transformation is called a global ga gauge transformation. Uh, the phase at all points in space is transformed uh, simultaneously. On the other hand, you can have a local gauge transformation. And the local gauge transformation is when it changes differently at every point in space and time, space time. And it's kind of surprising. If I make that transformation above um, and I make alpha a function of x, a completely arbitrary position. So it changes at every point differently. I can do this, but it requires a local transformation of the potential. Right, now just to remind us what is the potential. The potential is, right, so these are the potentials related to the electromagnetic field. So the local gauge transformation requires that A mu transforms like this so that the total derivative D mu psi, which is defined as D mu plus I E A mu is the electric charge of the particle. So this D mu psi will then transform correctly. Okay, so let's see how that works. D mu psi becomes D mu prime psi prime, and that's equal to D mu plus I E A mu prime psi prime, and that's equal to D mu plus I E A mu, but A mu has transformed, so we get this extra factor of I D mu alpha, and my E's are cancelling here, and my transformed psi prime. And now I am going to uh, apply this d mu, this d mu, and so the d mu is going to act all the way to the right, so it's going to act on this exponential part here, as well as the wave function itself. So this d mu is going to apply across all of those, and so I'm going to get the 
Either my IF is going to end up here, uh, here anyway. So the first thing is, it's just going to be D mu acting on the psi and minus I D mu alpha. That's the first part. And then the second part will be the plus I E A mu and plus I D mu alpha all acting on phi. So you can see that the this D mu has gone here and here, these two terms. And notes for later and now when I look at that I can see that that's nothing but e to the minus i alpha of d mu psi because this term and this term are going to cancel off so you can see that d mu psi is now transforming correctly which is what we want in the first place. That's why we invented that transformation on AMU. And what does that do? That means that D mu D mu psi becomes D mu prime D mu prime psi prime equals So that part transforms correctly, and that means that everything transforms correctly. And so the moral of the story is always, always use the covariant derivative. So always use the covariant derivative or P mu minus E A mu in your equations, and that way everything will always transform correctly. So going back to the Klein-Gordon equation now. We're going to look at the gauge invariance in the presence of a field. So whereas before we just had the Klein-Gordon equation, so let me write it out. So rather than having p mu p mu, we should have p mu minus e a mu, p mu minus e a mu equals m, oops, it's a quite good equation, I need a wave function. There's a Klein-Gordon equation. Um, let's just expand that out just uh, so that we get used to, to manipulating it. So I'll write that out as, so P mu is uh, I D mu minus E A mu. So that's expanding it out. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply those D mu's all the way to the right. So first term will be I D mu, I D mu, which is minus D mu, D mu, psi. We've also got this minus M squared phi. And then we've got some complicated ones. I, E, and let me write these out explicitly as well. So 
because it's acting all the way to the right. So we can write it like this. Yeah. It's important to remember. It's acting all the way to the right. And I've got a funky term here as well. Okay. Um, this d mu d mu, this guy here is the four dimensional D'Alembertian. Um, we've got m squared, I'm taking the minus sign. We've got some funky potential. All of that applied to the side of x equals zero. And u of x equals We can just, just, no, let's leave that as it is. Okay. Let's leave that as it is. So, um, oh, okay. Yeah. So sometimes the E and the AMU are put together, um, that, you know, the electric charge E and AMU to get like the potential for that particular particle. But let's leave it like this for the time being. So this consists of a vectory part. This is all vectory, uh, and this is a scalar invariant part. Of course, the whole thing is all scalar invariant by definition because it comes from a scalar invariant um, Lorentz term. All right, we're not quite done. Next thing we want to do with the Klein-Gordon equation is we want to think about uh, a, a, the plane wave solution. So let's forget about the potentials for a second and let's go back to the plane wave solutions. Of the equation, uh, we'll look at the plane wave solutions with no fields. So let's go and have a look at the plane wave solutions with no fields. So we're looking for psi goes as e to the minus i p mu x mu, which is e to the minus i p naught x naught. I'm just doing the expansion again so we get all used to it. Minus p dot x, which is e to the i e dot x minus e t. It's exactly what you expect. Then, if we find out, well, what are the solutions that actually satisfy the Klein-Gordon equation? So you substitute this in and you will find that e equals plus or minus the square root of m squared plus p squared. So that's weird. You've got a positive energy solution and a negative energy solution, and both of them will satisfy the Klein-Gordon equation. Okay. Well... This is a hint, but let's actually see how far we go with this. Let's actually consider the four current. So if you remember how to do the current in, uh, or if you don't remember how to do 
the current in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, it's probably worth just going and having a look at that uh, in Griffith's book or in your lecture notes uh, from last year or from, maybe from second year. So in order to derive the four current, we've got Remember, we're starting with the Klein-Gordon equation. So this is the Klein-Gordon equation, and then we've just multiplied it on the left by uh, psi star. And just in case, it just strikes me that maybe you guys have forgotten that grad that the Dilambertian is defined as d mu d mu, which is equal to d d t squared minus grad squared. Okay, just to remind us. Um, and then we'll take the uh, complex conjugate of this. This is, by the way, exactly the same procedure that you use in order to get the four current for the three-dimensional um, non-relativistic Schrodinger equation. Uh, now we subtract one from the other. And then we can uh, integrate by parts. In other words, first term and just check it by expansion, and you'll see that that actually works. And so that means that we can write that as d mu of something and this thing here we're going to call the current, the full current, j mu. And so we have a four current that's defined, like so, and um, it has a, the correct uh, conservation law that d mu j mu equals zero, All right? So we've got this j mu, and actually it's kind of uh, useful at this point to, to just scale it a little bit with um, some numbers. That's just so that the, uh, for, so that the, the density gives us, gives us the right uh, units. So if I put an I over 2M in here, so that's J mu. And why have I put the I over 2M? Because then if I write, then if I write the density, which is J zero, this then has the correct units and is a density. And this is the zero term because D mu is just DDT. Okay. And now we kind of come to a problem. And the problem is that this density is not positive definite.
It's not positive definite. And so for a long time, the Klein-Gordon equation was regarded as being physically senseless. What does it mean not positive def definite? Well, psi and d psi dt uh, can both have any values that they like. And because of that minus sign in this equation, it means that the density can be negative. And a negative density is like a negative probability. So a negative probability density at that point. And that doesn't make any sense. So that's what it means by physically senseless. And so for a while, the Klein-Gordon equation was abandoned. And we will remedy that. So that's enough of the formal development for the time being. And we'll continue with the formal development of the Klein-Gordon equation in uh, the next lecture. Uh, what I want to do next is I want to actually play with this a little bit and in a very nice case that we used to do a lot. And we'll see that how we can start to uh, rescue the Klein-Gordon equation and what it actually implies. So, a little Gedanken experiment. So, we've got a potential barrier with a step in it, like so. And this uh, a particle comes in from the left here. And it comes in with energy E. And it hits a barrier or well, hits a potential wall. And it wants to kind of continue on. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, the size of the barrier is the voltage times the electric charge of the particle. Um, so we've got region one and region two as shown there. Now, let's write down the Klein-Gordon equation with the potential. And maybe we leave it as a little bit of homework to show that in this case, it looks like Right, so that's just expanding out um, the potential U of X that I had in the previous um, page. And now we're going to write down the solutions in general terms uh, in region one and region two. Let's see what that looks like. Region one, it's a solution if and only if P is equal to the square root of E squared minus M squared. And it's one dimensional. So I'm defining P here as the positive square root. And similarly, I will define in region two waves like this. Capital P. I hope it doesn't get confusing. And this P is equal to the positive square root of EV minus E squared minus M squared. Okay, so we've got A in region one going to the right. We've got the term with the B coefficient going to the left in region one. We've got C going to the right in region two and D going to the left in region two. And so far it looks fine, right? I mean, you can work it out. Um, e is E squared. So E should include the mass. Um, so E squared minus M squared is going to be 
um, a positive quantity. And so little p will be the square root of a positive number. So little p is real. And so that means that um, inside one, uh, a and b will both be representing oscillatory terms. And however, if we look in region two, then we want to get complex P to have that exponential decay that we expect. In region two, if EV minus big E is less than M, i.e. if M plus E is greater than EV, uh, then P is complex. And all is well. We have exponential decays as expected. However, dun dun dun. If EV is greater than M plus E, in other words, if it's a particularly high barrier, then if EV is greater than E plus M, which is always going to be greater than 2M because E includes the rest mass, then P is real again. And that means that we have an, an oscillatory term non-decaying in the forbidden region. In other words, your particle comes in from the left, it sees the barrier, but it's a really high barrier, so it just decides to keep going straight through. And again, this looks terrifying. Um, in order to work out what's going on, we're going to work out the density in each one of these areas. So firstly, the density uh, everywhere. So density is equal to, and I'm going to do this generally, and then we'll see how it applies in each of the two regions separately. So here we've got the charge density. And the charge density is 2 times the energy minus 2 EV uh, times the um, amplitude squared. And this number is less than 0 if EV is greater than E. And so in other words, in this region that the charge density has an opposite sign. So in region two, the charge density has opposite sign to E. In other words, if it's a positively charged particle, in region two, in the case of a very high potential, EV much greater than, sorry, EV greater than E plus M, then uh, the charge density has an opposite sign to E. So if it's a positively charged particle, the charge density in region two is negative, and if it's a negatively charged particle, then the charge density in region two is positive. So that means, um, well, let's see what means. Like, so we've got that one. Okay, okay, all good. Let's continue on. Uh, let's work out the current. The current and the current j is equal to minus i h bar over 2m remember in this frame i've got no um vector potential i've only got the scalar potential so that's the definition of it and that means that in the region uh, two, what do I get? I get J for the first term, let's say JC, 
that's going to be uh, plus 2p. So you'll have to check that yourself. So you just take that derivative. And remember that these grads are just ddz's in the case where we have a single a one dimensional problem so jc is greater than 0 and if we do jd that's equal to minus 2p or so in region d the um, current is negative. So what does that mean? It means that our C, our term our term C E to the I P Z minus E T that either is a positive charge going to the right or it's a negative charge going to the left. And similarly, d e to the r minus i p z plus e t is either a positive charge going to the left or it's a negative charge going to the right. So, again, it's because the current JC is greater than zero. It corresponds to a positive charge going to the right or a negative charge going to the left. The current JD is less than zero, which means it's a positive charge going to the left or it's a negative charge going to the right. However, we already agreed that the density in region two, in the case of a large, uh, a high barrier, a high potential, um, that we agreed that that uh, density was negative. So in all of this, the only thing that gives us a consistent picture is to have, because we want the particle coming from the left and not coming from the right, that means that the consistent picture is to have minus E going to the right. And then that would make sense with the setup of the, of the problem. So what is the energy here? The particle sees a negative potential minus EV, right? Because now on the right-hand side in region two, it's a negative particle now with minus E. So the potential is minus EV. But on the other hand, P equals square root of E V minus big E squared minus M squared implies a kinetic energy of E V minus E. How do I reconcile this? What's happening is that for the particle on the right-hand side, the problem kind of looks like this. So it's got a kinetic energy such that this is EV minus E. And this point is at minus EV, this is zero, because that's the potential that it sees. And that means that the total energy is equal to, I'm going to run out of space there. The total energy for the particle is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy and that's equal to minus E. So it's at minus E. So this is what the particle, this is what the problem looks like from the perspective of the 
negatively charged particle, which is apparently existing in region two and going to the right. Putting it all together, we set C equals zero because we remember that uh, that the consistent picture was to have back up here. The consistent picture was for in region two there not to be any C, there just to be D. So we set C equals zero. Then at Z equals zero at the boundary, we need to have analytic continuity. So um, the wave function on the left-hand side equals the wave function on the right-hand side at z equals zero, and also the derivative. So this one is due to psi uh, in region one at region two at z equals zero, and the next one is you take the derivatives This is derivatives are equal at z equals zero. And then the solution of this is to have a equals a half minus p over 2p times d and b equal to a half plus big P over 2P times D. Um, now we set the incoming amplitude A equal to one. Uh, then we'll get D equals minus 2P over big P minus little p and B equals minus big P plus little p over big P minus little p. All right, and so we can write down the final wave functions. So one equals e to the i p z minus e t. Remember a equals one minus. And in region two, we have minus two P over big P minus little P E to the I P Z plus E T. I forgot the minus sign. There we go. Okay, so that's our consistent solution to this problem. Um, let's quickly work out um, the reflection coefficient and the transmission coefficients, just like what we used to do um, in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So the reflection coefficient R is equal to uh, B squared over A squared, which equals P plus P over P minus P squared. And because big P and little P are both um, real numbers and both of them positive, this thing actually ends up being bigger than one. Um, for the transmission coefficient, we need to be a little bit more careful. Let's define it. The transmission is the current going to the left, to the right in region two over the current in region one going to the right. Um, you could also define the reflection coefficient the same way. We just don't need to because it ends up being the same. But this ends up being minus two p times the magnitude of d squared over two little p, magnitude of a squared. 
and that is equal to that is equal to minus four little p big p over big p minus little p squared so it's negative and therefore you've got r bigger than one and t negative in such a way add them together and you can see just by inspection that if you add them together you'll get one yeah if you can't see that straight away then just do it by hand um so r plus t equals one so the consistent picture again just to wrap up here is you've got a particle coming in from the left it's coming into this wall and then afterwards you've got a bigger particle going to the left and some particle antiparticle going to the right so this is like uh, the consistent picture and it shows that even without having to do any second quantization or anything funky like that, uh, we have pair production at a barrier if the barrier is large enough. And this is going to come up again and again in our studies of relativistic quantum mechanics. But I think that's all for today and I will leave it there. Take care of yourselves.